Good evening on this Thursday night. I'm Laurel Porter. We begin with the plan to curb crime in Portland's central east side. Dozens of business owners met with the city saying something has to be done soon. They cited months of increasing crime and trash, threatening worker safety. Now they'll try a strategy similar to the one used in Old Town. Catherine Cook went to find out how the plan worked out there. Catherine? Well, Laurel, it starts with a 90 day reset plan. That includes increased police presence and cleanup efforts, but maybe more than that. It's the start of a partnership between the neighborhood and the city to achieve specific goals. Here's how it worked for Old Town. So for Old Town, our new normal is that it's not a free for all. Not a free for all for crime, trash and violence. That's how Jesse Burke saw Old Town at its very worst, though challenges there continue. Burke co-owns the Society Hotel and chairs the Old Town Community Association. Her new normal perspective comes months after Old Town completed a 90 day reset plan with the city's help. It started back in March with a commitment to working together. We're all stuck in the same boat, so we better be rowing in the same direction. Otherwise, we're going to start spinning in circles. And I think that we have been spinning in circles for the last couple of years. Now in forward motion, Old Town leaders picked three specific areas to improve upon within their 90 day plan. Safety, cleanliness and accessibility. Areas where they hoped to be able to measure improvement. For the trash, Burke asked for three dedicated cleaners and a driver from Clean and Safe. He's telling us he's sometimes making three trips a day to the dump um, just with his one truck, just from Old Town. Burke also asked the city for better lighting, specifically to double the lumens coming from lampposts. When a city employee checked the lumens, they made an interesting discovery. The takeaway was actually that the lumens were a little bit higher than average. And the reason for the darkness was that the buildings weren't leaving their lights on or that the lights were broken. I could check in and say, hey, this is really meaningful feedback and I can fix that problem right away. Burke says that's just one example of how they worked with the city to find a solution instead of just complaining about an assumption. You have to take back your neighborhood and speak up for it. On Tuesday, Burke shared her experiences with business leaders from the Central East Side Industrial Council a neighborhood many here say is unsafe to work in. This week, business leaders and city officials will hammer out their own 90-day reset plan. We deal with break-ins, uh, we deal with assaults. Darren Marshall is CEO of Stephen Smith Teamaker, headquartered on the Central East Side. For us, we need to see uh, results and actions. Whether a 90-day reset plan will deliver them remains to be seen. But from where Burke stands, committing to finding solutions together, then daring to try them out has made a lot of sense. I'm excited for them to all go through the work and then see the results on the other side. Old Town's 90 day reset plan ended in June, but a lot has happened since then. Burke points to the city reinstating the police bureau's entertainment detail in September. She says it's played a critical role in curbing gun violence in that neighborhood. Laurel. Let's hope this all works for the Central East Side too. Thank you, Catherine. Another part of a solution, new affordable housing. The Starlight had its grand opening in Old Town today. The apartment building at 6th and Flanders includes 100 units. 70 of them are reserved for people experiencing chronic homelessness. The rest are for people with limited incomes. On site, we'll be providing culturally specific programming, connecting folks to housing, health care resources, employment resources. We're really excited to see the community grow and profoundly improve here in the Old Town District. Now, right now, all units are reserved and there is a wait list for the mix of studio and one bedroom units. For more information, head to centralcityconcern.org. Turning now to our snow and winter weather, here's a spot where snow isn't typical, the coast. Check out the scene, just beautiful there in Beverly Beach this afternoon. This is near Newport. Thank you to Lee for sending this video to us. You can even see a deer hanging out there to complete that picturesque view. We could also see snow this afternoon on our Newport Sky Camera, and our viewers in the Seaside and Astoria area said they got some snow today too. It's still cold enough for snow tonight. Let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino.
Now, Matt, could more areas see snow tomorrow? And a lot of people want to know about Portland. Yeah, no and no, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's cold. It's definitely cold out, but we're sorely lacking in moisture. 35 degrees in Portland right now. Pressure is going up, though, really rapidly. But look, it's already down to 30 in Scappoose, 30 in Hillsborough, so below freezing, 29 in McMinnville. And the coast is cold as well, 32 at Astoria. 34 in Tillamook. So yes, it's cold enough, but when we look at Doppler radar, there's hardly anything going on here. We've got a broken line of showers along the coast, so there could be a flurry or a brief snow shower out along the coast um, this evening or early tomorrow morning. But for the valleys, I think we're basically going to be staying dry as there's really just not, <coughs> pardon me, not that much coming our way. So a few scattered shower, snow showers are possible, mainly couple of flurries, that would be it. No accumulations, though. It will stay cold, though, right on through the weekend. We'll talk more about that a little later. Laurel, back to you. Let's get you caught up now in tonight's other headlines. A four mile stretch of Highway 30 headed to the coast remains closed tonight as crews clean up a major landslide. This is between Astoria and Klatskanai. ODOT is trying to get one lane open, but says it may be this weekend before that happens. In a stunning reversal, prosecutors have dropped all charges against a man arrested for a decades-old murder. Richard Knapp was charged with the 1994 rape and murder of a young Vancouver mother. He was arrested in 2019 after detectives compared DNA from the crime scene to a public DNA database. But Knapp's defense says new evidence cast doubt on the case, and prosecutors said they didn't feel confident they could prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. While awaiting trial, Knapp lost his job, his home, and his wife, who died while he was in jail. And Multnomah County is moving forward with a proposal to ban selling flavored tobacco and nicotine products. Commissioners approved a first reading of the proposal today, and they're expected to give it final approval later this month. If it ultimately passes, the ban would start in January 2024. Supporters say the goal is to keep tobacco away from kids and teens. Opponents worry, though, about the impact on small businesses. Portland Thorns fans are reacting tonight to news the team is going up for sale. Owner Merritt Paulson has been under pressure to sell after an investigation revealed a toxic culture within the soccer club. Mike Benner reports. Portland, go celebrate! This night belonged to the Thorns! Fresh off their third National Women's Soccer League Championship, the Portland Thorns are for sale. Owner Merritt Paulson revealing the news Thursday morning. It's a really good step forward, uh, but it's not complete yet. Tina Etlin is a member of the Rose City uh, Riveters Ford Steering Committee and a member of the 107ist, a nonprofit that supports both the Thorns and Timbers. It's Tina's belief that Paulson should not stop at selling the Thorns. Yeah, I mean, the same reason Merritt is unfit to own the Thorns is the same reason he's unfit to own the Timbers. So, um, I mean, he still needs to sell the Timbers as well. For now, there are no plans to do that. Paulson only intends to sell the Thorns, a decision that does not come out of nowhere, not by a long shot. You might recall back in October, Paulson removed himself as CEO of the Thorns and Timbers. The shakeup at the top of both soccer clubs coming after a months-long investigation into allegations of abuse in the NWSL. The investigation revealed a toxic culture of sexual, emotional, and verbal abuse across the league and within the Thorns organization. Former coach Paul Riley was to blame for a lot of that, but the investigation also showed patterns of misconduct by Paulson and front office staffers Gavin Wilkinson and Mike Golub, who were dismissed. I don't know if I'd be able to start with anything, but I'm sorry. That's Paulson telling sports columnist and radio show host John Canzano in a one-on-one -on -one interview he failed the players, namely the ones who were subjected to the abuse. Paulson also took ownership for his handling of coach Paul Riley. There's no excuse for that coach ever working another day. He shouldn't have been working to begin with. Uh, and certainly never should have worn a Portland Thorns badge. Um, we could have done more and we could have done better. And they were failed by uh, institutions and people. And, uh, you know, I think the league's going to be stronger coming out of this. That's certainly the hope. And playing a big role in that will be the Thorns' next owner, who, according to Tina Etlin, 
must check a lot of boxes. Any group or person that will center the players and the employees within that building and make sure that their needs are met first and foremost. Um, somebody that understands the history of soccer in Portland and embraces that. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News.